morning, everybody. Ooh, I've never been accused of being quiet, but this is pretty loud. Maybe we can turn it down a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, it's great to see everybody here. Greg, thank you so much for that introduction. I, I have to teach you that we need to set expectations a lot lower uh, and then exceed them as opposed to setting them so high and I probably won't reach them. So, But I, I do appreciate that. Very, very kind introduction. Um, let me go ahead and get this going. But maybe if there's someone who can deal with the sound, we, if we can turn this down a little bit, I think it's probably a little too loud, I'm guessing, for most. Um, it's great to be with all of you this morning, and I just want to uh, acknowledge there's so many people here in the audience and doing great work, and, you know, I, I've done uh, work with, with many of you. Um, Sue Rushi, oh, no, there we go, yeah. That's much better. Uh, Sue Rushi in the audience, who I met when I was uh, 18 in Washington, D.C., as, as she was uh, uh, speaking at a plenary, and we've had a partnership and a relationship ever since on, in this issue, uh, working, of course, with the Council on Drugs. Um, a former SAM associate, who's now one of Georgia's own, Brad Nelson, here working with uh, Chris Wood and, and many of you, and now recently working with Chris Manning and Public Strategies has been a real pleasure. So um, I feel sort of right at home, even though this is not my home state. And uh, I want to thank everyone for their for their kindness and hospitality. But I'm really excited to talk about uh, and really this issue that I think is. Um, you know, one of the most misunderstood issues really here in America when it comes to drugs. You know, unlike a drug like heroin or cocaine, you know, marijuana is a drug that frankly often takes a little bit of time to see the negative effects. And, um, you know, because most people who have ever tried marijuana really have tried the marijuana of the 60s, 70s, or 80s, a lot of people don't quite understand what we're talking about with today's really super strength, high potency marijuana. And, you know, I'm sort of speaking to the choir here, so I'm not having to convince you, I hope not, of the dangers of marijuana or the harms. I'm going to highlight a couple of things that I think are just important as you go and talk about this in your, uh, in your work. Um, you know, and the main thing to talk about is, like I was just saying, the marijuana of today is very different than the marijuana of 20 or 30 years ago. You know, I, this is... Um, was sort of hit home for me. I spoke in front of a high school in Iowa about two months ago, and the person introducing me said, uh, Dr. Sabet is gonna be speaking about, you know, that roach clip that gets passed around at a lot of your parties. Now this was to a ninth to 12th graders, okay? Um, completely glazed look. Somebody, uh, you know, raised his hand. I think he, they said, well, wait a minute, is he talking about insect extermination or what is he, what is he doing? <laughs> And then another kid raised his hand and said, is he going to be talking about dabs? And the poor vice principal, you know, uh, a woman in her 60s, she said, no, he's talking about marijuana. Um, and if you don't know what dabs are, I'm sure most of you do, I'll talk about it in a minute and you're not alone. But the point is, there is a huge generational divide between what, you know, the baby boomers remember fondly and even, you know, the generation after that remember fondly about smoking marijuana in the dorms and what today's marijuana is all about. And I don't think that that is something that's often communicated. And, and we know this has gone up because the active ingredient in marijuana, THC, is what gets you high. And it's essentially been bred to be in higher potency. Um, I saw a woman the other day, she came to one of my talks, she was sort of protesting my talk. She said, uh, you know, I don't really want to be here. I disagree with everything you say, but you know, uh, I hope that the lunch you serve is, you know, organic, vegan, locally sourced. Uh, and I said, I don't know. You have to ask the, the people in charge. And she said, Well, um, and and you know, uh, I am organic, vegan. I'm all about locally sourced, and I'm a big fan of marijuana. And I told her, I said, I hate to break the news to you. You could not have a more GMO processed item than the marijuana of today. Talk about genetic modification. Um, and I sort of crushed her dreams of marijuana being the, you know, the plant, the natural herb, um, you know, from, from the divine source, uh, which is what she thought. And, and really it's because we have just gotten much better with agriculture, folks, in the last 30 years. You know, you, you used to want to get Mexican marijuana 30 or 40 years ago. That was the, 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 the more potent stuff. Um, but, you know, made in the USA marijuana these days is just much better than, the, than any marijuana you're getting from a foreign source. And that's because it's been genetically modified. And I know the issue of CBD has been discussed a lot in this state. We'll talk about it later. But, you know, CBD has been basically bred out of modern marijuana. In other words, the kids smoking marijuana in Georgia today get only trace amounts, if that, of CBD. What is CBD? It's another one of 500 components in marijuana and it doesn't get you high. In fact, it takes the high away. Um, 
and that's actually why it's been bred out because nobody wants to grow marijuana that doesn't get you high. It doesn't really make sense. Um, and you know, the other thing that I just think is interesting to highlight that I doubt most baby boomers know about is this butane hash oil. How many of you, I'm sure most of you have seen this or heard of it before, but it's essentially a new way of extracting the THC from marijuana. Um, and I don't know about you, but this right here, like when it looks like this, this looks like another drug to me that starts with an H and ends with an N, more than it look, much more than it looks like marijuana. I, mean, I don't think Cheech and Chong in their wildest dreams could have imagined marijuana at the end of the needle. Um, but that's essentially what we're what we're seeing with the new butane hash oil, basically extracted THC concentrates that are popping up everywhere. And you've seen them here, right? Have there been any explosions yet? Because you know, in many states around the country. Um, this is a very you know, dangerous process. In fact, you, you probably can guess, I don't really quote high times that often. You can probably imagine why. But this quote I couldn't resist because they were right on the money. Um, and they basically were talking about this, which is the slang term is dabbing. And they said, with dabs, your local action news team gets to do a marijuana story that shows crack pipe torches used on sticky heroin looking goo made from a process that blows up like meth labs. You know, the, the, this is one area where High Times has it right. And again, I don't think most parents, let alone most Americans, really understand what we're talking about with marijuana um, and the marijuana of today. You all know the data on the more likely you use marijuana, the more likely you are to drop out of school, to have less income, um, all these sorts of things. This has all been documented in, in research on and on. Um, you, you, sorry, we know about the issue of psychosis and mental health. You know, I, I'm not going to go into the great detail, but the, the issue of mental illness is something that is often not talked about. And the big study that came out a few uh, last year about IQ, you know, basically finding that significant reduction in IQ, significant more likely to have an eight point reduction in IQ among those people who smoke three to four times a week for three to four years. Now, whenever I present this, I, I'm usually talking in front of parents. And of course, every parent thinks their kid is a genius. And I always have to sort of break the news to them, kind of like the you know girl, the organic girl. And I have to say, well, you know, I hate to break it to you, but it's impossible, like just statistically impossible, for every kid in here or every every one of your children to be a genius. Now, if they were a genius and they lost eight points off of 150, you know, you're still pretty smart, right? I mean, 142 is still pretty good. Um, but the problem is. The average isn't 150, which is what Steve Jobs was when he was in 12th grade. Not everybody's Steve Jobs, I'm sorry to say. The average is 100. And when you lose eight points off of 100, that has meaningful results. Now, now we're not saying, and again, this is part of the whole, you know, what I like in my book, I talk about the, the baggage that adults have today when it comes to marijuana. What I mean by that is that, you know, Many adults just can't believe anything the government or science says about marijuana because of previous exaggerations. They're very reticent to believe anything. And, um, you know, whether you believe it or not it is another story, but this is what today's science is saying. Um, and you lose eight points on 100, and, and that, that's, that's a major, uh, that has a major effect. You know, I think about the class of 2014, and I think about how it's the worst time in American history since the Great Depression to look for a job. I think about how it's the worst time in our history, to, um, the worst chances in our history that the class of 2014 will do better than their parents' generation. It's almost the worst time in our history to have a family, a healthy family, even with all the scientific sort of advances that we've gotten. And the idea, and then you look at the mental health impacts and the school violence and all that stuff. And all of that combined, the idea that we want to add marijuana to the mix when we know it at least triggers, it can trigger some of this, I think is um, something that most Americans don't fully realize or appreciate. And, and again, we have to emphasize, we're not saying that everybody who uses marijuana is going to lose eight points on IQ or everybody that ever uses it is gonna have a psychotic episode. We have to be very clear, we're not saying that. What we're saying is you're increasing your chances. You're playing Russian roulette, and that's up to you if you're gonna play Russian roulette, but I don't think that most Americans even know that they're playing Russian roulette. That's the issue, that's why we need to educate. 
You know, uh, how many of you have been hanging out at the, and I know, I realize it's a very astute crowd here that deals with this every day, so maybe some of your hands will go up, but how many of you hang out at the annual meeting of the American Medical Association every year? Not even this group, right? Can you imagine the average American? Anybody hang out at the annual meeting of the Journal of the American Psychiatric Association? One, okay, good. Uh, anybody scroll through pages 1030 to 1047 of the annals of the American Medical Association last year? Anybody, nighttime reading? No? So imagine about the average American if this group, uh, and me included, uh, are not reviewing the literature. You know, do we think kids use Medline when they search for marijuana information or do they use Google? By the way, do you know what Medline is? Medline is where you search for peer-reviewed articles. That's like the Google for that, right? Most of you know that. Well, I think most kids, unfortunately, use Google. And this is what we're fighting against. It's this kind of perception um, and this kind of misinformation. So what we know versus what matters is very different. I wish it wasn't. I wish it was just, well, talk about the science. And just present it and everyone will understand it. I wish that was that easy. But unfortunately, it's not. Um, and so I really, I talk about how the gulf has never been greater between the scientific understanding of marijuana's harms and the public's misunderstanding. That's really where we are. Now, I wanna switch gears into more strategic discussion. We've had a huge change over, this is blurry, over the last 10 years in the percentage of Americans who believe that marijuana essentially is okay, should be legalized. Um, this is big, this is 2003, only 34% thought it should. Now we're about 51. We've actually seen a decline recently, and we can talk about that later if we want. But still, there's been a steady increase. And we think about why has this been the case? Well, I'm going to argue that this has been the case really because marijuana has been presented like this. You know, what, do I, what do I mean? I mean that the face of marijuana has gone from the lazy stoner who lives at home until age 50 and doesn't get out of the basement to the 85-year-old with cancer. Now, nobody is gonna vote against 85-year-old with cancer. By the way, the new face is the three-year-old with uncontrollable epilepsy. Think anyone's gonna vote against the three-year-old? That's actually even a better. <laughs> you, the only class of person that is more sympathetic than this person is the three-year-old with epilepsy, right? Because they're younger, because they have their whole life ahead of them, right? And that's now the new face of this. So we wonder, how did this change? Well, it changed because perception changed very quickly from this to this. Um, and I'm not gonna show, well, there's a video, we don't have time, it's only 50 seconds, but um, actually, you know what, I am gonna show it because it's pretty enlightening, and this is the main quote from it. But I, I think this is very telling about where we are and how we sort of got to where we are. Um, it's right here. If you can, hopefully you can hear it okay, but if not. So you're only gonna get these people to agree that marijuana is medicine. Yeah. <laughs> but if you think about marijuana, how we use it, why we use it, it doesn't have additional reason build a coalition of senior citizens, of housewives and professionals and doctors and lawyers and nurses. Mm -hmm. You know, politics is illusion. Right. Show us on the wall. It's pictures, it's, it's photos, it's an AP wire. Right. And uh, so I, I created an illusion, but I articulated what marijuana that changed the face from a long hair hippie to his mother. Kind of like a, I don't know, like a fantasy story mm -hmm. that I could do something in the middle of the war on drugs like that. And, uh, do it for three and a half years and uh, get away with it. <laughs> Well, and that's really what we're talking about, folks. This is as scientific as it is, it's also political. You know, uh, this is about a coalition of senior citizens, housewives, professionals, doctors, lawyers. Um, we've changed the face from the hippie to Hazel Rogers, who that was, and, you know, in the middle of the war on drugs. That's really why we are where we are, really. This face has changed. So how do we then talk about marijuana in this environment is the question when we kind of have all of these things almost seeming like against us. Well, I have a couple of ideas that I'm gonna throw out there that we've been doing for the last couple of years with Project Sam, partnering with the National Families in Action and the marijuanareport.org. Um, one of those things is, you know, we are linking what marijuana is about. We're we wanna change the face, frankly, from the medical person, the sort of, you know, kind of funny joke, that thing that you do in college, to the Wall Street CEO. 
because that is actually what's happening. What do I mean by that? I mean that this is, legalization folks is about one thing, okay? It's not about medicine. It's not about getting people out of jail. It's not about ending the war on drugs. It's not even about allowing adults to use a little marijuana in the privacy of their own home. I'm just gonna turn the volume down a little. It, it is about, on the other hand, one thing, and that one thing is money. That's really what this is about. When we follow what's happening and who's supporting this and where this is going, it's about getting rich. Uh, just like at the end of alcohol prohibition, the alcohol companies came out. Now the marijuana companies think this is their chance. You know, they're they're alive in the one time in human, you know, the, the third time in the, in the in American history where a drug has been legalized and normalized. Well, you could say fourth if you include pharmaceuticals, uh, tobacco, alcohol, pharmaceuticals. Now marijuana. This is their way to cash in. So what I think we need to do in a very honest way is show how this is actually happening. Um, and and we've been doing that with you know with graphics and talking about how you know the face of marijuana is not Cheech and Chong it's not the Grateful Dead it's these guys it's guys with the Yale MBAs who now some people think this guy looks like me kind of offended by that but anyway <laughs> um, it's it's sort of it, it, but it's that that is what I say is scary you know what scares me is not the sixty year old ex hippie who wants to relive their glory years you know once a month in their basement and smoke a joint after work on the weekends. I really don't care. Now, I don't want that person, you know, driving a car in my neighborhood or performing brain surgery or flying a plane, um, that's for sure. But all things considered, that is not what this is about. What this is about is hooking as many people as possible. And these guys have the business plan to do it. And it's not, these guys are the real, there are also other people. This is just, this is just one example, it's not just the only one. Um, and remember, addictive businesses don't make money off of the casual user. I'll repeat that. Addictive businesses don't make money off the casual user. They rely on the heavy user to make money. So if any of you enjoy a glass of wine with dinner every night, I have some news for you. You are very unimportant people in the eyes of the alcohol industry. You're not paying their salaries. The 80% of Americans who drink responsibly they only consume 20% of all the alcohol. It's the 20% of Americans that consume 80% of the alcohol that are alcoholics or borderline alcoholics that are actually the ones that are the most important to the industry. We just have to be very clear about that. When you go to, when you go to Las Vegas and you see the guy that gets upgraded to the penthouse suite at you know whatever hotel, is the person that gets upgraded the guy that they don't recognize who plays blackjack once every other year, $100 on his birthday? Or is it the guy that's there every other week betting his life savings on the craps table? Well, it's obviously that guy. That's because you've got to you know, ingratiate your best customers. They're the ones who pay the bills. And when we want to think about legalization, it's about getting that proportion of people addicted. And by the way, who is that proportion? Where do you have to start? Young people. With young people. Raise your hand if you know a drug addict or alcoholic who started using their drug of choice after age 21. In other words, abstained and then all of a sudden at 21 started drinking, never touched out a drink or never touched drugs and then became addicted. Anybody know? Yeah. Not one person. This is That's right. Because 99% of addiction starts at a young age. Opiates are one exception. <coughs> But the illicit, the fully illicit drugs, you start young. What's the, who are the other groups that are targeted by the industry? The, frankly, the disenchanted among us, those in lower socioeconomic class. I don't know about Atlanta, so you tell me if it's wrong, but I just came from Detroit literally last night, and I was in LA before that, and, both of, and I was in Baltimore. In all three of these cities, I'm not sure about Atlanta, you tell me, but in all three of those cities, there are eight times as many liquor stores in poor communities of color than in upper class white communities. Is it different here? No. I didn't think so. Because you go after the ones that have the least, essentially social safeguards, the least access to stable housing, healthcare, education, et cetera, et cetera. Because you want to go after the most vulnerable. 
they're, they're the ones who you want to get, you know, be, be buying these substances more. So we, along with many groups in here that helped us and other groups around the country, we've started this campaign of trying to change the face of marijuana from the perception of the long-haired hippie to the reality of the Wall Street CEO. Because we think that most Americans, when they remember the horror and deceit of big tobacco, 100 years of lies and deceit, companies that said, as late as 1999, folks, they were saying they weren't sure about the link between smoking and lung, and, uh, lung cancer. The evidence was mixed about smoking and premature death. They never targeted young people. Joe Camel was really meant for the 57-year-old male smoker. Candy cigarettes were really meant for the 45-year-old female. They got away with those lies for 100 years. And no matter what you think about smoking, um, I, I don't even know smokers that defend the tobacco industry or the executives that led that industry for so long, at least. And so we're trying to make that parallel. Um, there was just the announcement you all heard, the Marley family has gotten into the game. Yes. I think Bob Marley is rolling in his grave to imagine that the symbol of revolution is now a corporate shill. Because they were just bought by those guys I just showed you. Um, so we need to remember what tobacco did, and we sometimes need to give people a refresher. Because I don't think many Americans remember the asthma cigarettes that were peddled for so long. Somebody had asthma problems? Oh, yes. Well, we have Dr. Batty's cigarettes for you. Um, or, or any of the other things that we had. The second thing is we need to talk about how things are going badly already. Folks, this isn't a theory anymore. This is happening in many states, and we're already collecting the problems. There's a website called legalizationviolations.com we put up that is trying to collect some of the data, and not the data, some of the news articles. Um, this is what it looks like. I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but we have the data showing, and I'm happy to share all this with, with you, that Colorado's not going well. The increase in hospital admissions, the, the two deaths that have already happened this year, the accidental poisonings, the edibles. You know, Do you think that the soccer mom in Littleton, Colorado, who voted for Mitt Romney, also wanted there to be uh, grape-flavored gummy bears that were marijuana-laced? Do you think they had any idea that it was about that? I don't think so. Because I think if the campaign was about gummy bears, it would have lost. But that is a lot of what this is about. In fact, they're trying to regulate it now, and they ended in deadlock uh, two nights ago because the industry would not agree to any of the quote-unquote sensible regulations. And my friends who say, well, we can regulate it. We can at least try and you know, put a label on it and do some... None of that's happening when you have a massive industry that really has no incentive to give in to any of those demands. We need to talk about these food items as much as possible. And where is the tax revenue? It's not nearly as high as it was gonna be. You know, that was the other reason people voted for this, was tax revenue. Um, it, and, and it wasn't nearly as high. And so here's some of the data on, on drugged driving. I wanna go forward because we're out of time. Um, you know, use having gone up in Colorado versus a modest increase nationally. Here's the tax revenue numbers. Here's some of the things, the edibles, the Nutella here. This one is show your ski pass and receive a $1 joint. I can tell you I'm not going skiing in Colorado anymore because I, I have a hard enough time like when people are not high. <laughs> that the last thing I, I want to be around are people that are high or the lift operators who you, God knows. And that's a whole other issue, which we're going to talk about, is the workplace as well. And um, National Families in Action is writing a paper on this. Um, about the impacts on the workplace. There are many leaders here, Thomas and others, um, that talk about this. I don't think corporate America quite understands this yet. I'm not sure Home Depot and Walmart understand that what happens when they're trying to deliver something in one state versus another state, when someone's coming to work and has an accident on Monday, tests positive for marijuana and says, no, 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 I used marijuana on Saturday. I wasn't impaired. It's just in my system. You can't prove that I was impaired. Or the employer right now in Rhode Island who's being sued for interviewing somebody, finding out she had a medical marijuana card and deciding not to hire her. And all of a sudden that woman is now suing her potential employer for job discrimination. Now, whether or not the judge, wherever the judge goes on that, that's costing the company time, hours, and a lot of money. 
I don't think corporate America realizes that yet. That's a whole other issue we haven't even talked about. Here's some more of the edibles. Now, these were the sodas that were developed for cancer patients. Because, you know, the 80-year-old cancer patient with, you know, a ridiculous pain really wants the great flavored THC soda that no regulatory body has ever tested for any kind of bacteria or anything like that. This is all legal now. Um, here is a, I went into one of the, sto the stores last month, and I don't know about you, this doesn't look like a mirror, this looks like a candy store. And by the way, when I went in, I just gotta show this with you, they said, are you, they said, welcome to wherever, they said, are you medical or recreational, they asked me. <laughs> and I responded, well, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> and they said, well, depends how much time you have. That, that was what it was. And I said, well, tell me more, you know. They, they said, well, um, they said, well, if you have some time, if you have to, we're gonna call the doctor, he'll be here in three minutes. They'll give you the evaluation. You have $300 cash. Don't worry, there's an ATM machine. They only charge you $8 to get money out. Um, and uh, if you can get your cat, $300 for the assessment. That'll last two minutes. Um, and then you'll be able to get marijuana at a, non, at a lower tax rate than the recreational. Because recreational is a higher tax rate because that's how it was sold to the voters. We'll tax it and regulate it, right? That's what. So I said, well, I don't really have time for that because I was actually on my way to the airport, but I wanted to buy an edible to show people. In fact, I have it in my bag. Not, don't worry, the marijuana's gone. It's just the packaging. Um, <laughs> for the long DEA folks in here, don't, don't bring me out in cuffs. I promise. It's just the, it's just the packaging. Um, and essentially, um, uh, uh, I, I had $60 cash on me. I didn't feel like paying $8 in ATM fees. So I thought I could buy five or six things. I could afford two candy bars recreationally because I also had to pay the tax and buy the childproof bag for four seventy five, dollars And the childproof bag is a white Ziploc with a plastic fastener. In fact, I added that also. Um, so we wonder why the black market is thriving in Colorado. Folks, it's never been a better time to be a drug dealer in Colorado. Let me tell you, if you know anybody looking for work, that's where to go. Why? You undercut the legal price, Law enforcement looks the other way because you had this in your car because you're, you grew it in your house and you bought it from a, just from a store. You, there's no law to show a receipt. There's no registry. In fact, they asked me for my name and I asked them why. And they said, well, we just want to keep track on email. And I said, I don't want to give my name. And they said, okay, that's okay. So there's no tracking. And by the way, what, how do you think uh, uh, law enforcement in surrounding states are doing over there, surrounding Colorado? They're having a field day. Talk about arrests going up because people are bringing so much stuff out of the state. We also, and I don't have a lot of time to talk about all this, but we need to often, and when we discuss this, meet people where they are. You know, a lot of people can't understand why alcohol is legal and marijuana is not. You know, and I simply say, listen, alcohol has a long history in our culture, dating back 5,000 years. Okay, that cat's out of the bag. 60% of Americans drink. We're not gonna outlaw something that 60% of Americans do on a regular basis. You know how many percentage of Americans smoke marijuana? Seven and a half. So it's, these are apples and oranges. Now in terms of the effects on your body, they're different. Alcohol affects your liver, marijuana affects you know, your mental health and mental state, they're all very different. And so this comparison is very, very unhelpful. And the other thing I tell people is, well, how do you think we're doing when it comes to alcohol regulation? Are we doing a great job? How are those taxes doing? For every dollar in alcohol tax, folks, we spend 10 in social costs. Why would we replicate that? Uh, it's no example to follow. It's just kind of something that we're stuck with. Uh, the CBD issue, obviously, and we're gonna have, I think Greg's talking a little bit about that today, later, we'll talk about that. Um, the bottom line with CBD, folks, we should get it to kids who need it and find a way to do it right. I don't know why it's that so hard. It really doesn't have to be that hard. We've made it very hard. Um, and the incarceration issue, you know, most people are not locked up for marijuana, but I think we need to be clear that there are some people with criminal records in different local jurisdictions for small amounts. We can fix those laws without legalizing marijuana. The worst argument for legalization is that, well, we have criminal, we, we, we give people criminal records for it. That, fine, fix it if you want, if you feel like fixing it. You can do that without going overboard. And let me tell you something, the support for legalization does not come from people that wanna just smoke marijuana. 
Do we think 51% of Americans are in favor of legalization because they all want to smoke pot legally tomorrow? No. 80% of them, when you look into that data, they are in favor of it because they don't like a perceived failure of a war on drugs. And then you deep, probe deeper and they say, well, we don't think adults should be locked up and arrested for marijuana. Now, of course, in most places, that's not happening anyway. But the perception is it's happening everywhere. And maybe in some places it is. Um, it, you know, it varies. So, fine. Let's fix that without going overboard is what I would say. Um, getting to the end. So I don't think that our choices are either legalization or incarceration. This is the false choice presented in front of us. You know, what do you feel about drug policy? Do you want to legalize or put people in prison? Well, isn't there another way? Can't we deal with this with prevention, education, early intervention, um, and other, other things? I, I think that there is. Finally, we need to frankly learn from the marijuana movement, folks. And the number one thing we need to learn is that a story is worth, I like to say, a thousand peer-reviewed articles. <laughs> And that's true, because you can have all the data in the world about CBD and THC and non-smoked and smoked and this and that. You wheel the three-year-old with epilepsy into the state house, you've just lost. Good luck convincing anybody with data that that kid shouldn't be getting it at any rate possible. You know, you bring the one person that has had a bad experience in law enforcement and talked about how it's destroyed their life, they had a criminal record, they couldn't get a job, they became a heroin dealer, their family fell apart, their family broke up. It's very difficult to counter that. And so we actually need to start talking about the stories too. I mean, we have stories of mental health problems, of kids um, that have had multiple issues with marijuana. Um, a woman on our advisory board who's one of the most prominent uh, scientists in the country on tobacco, who actually works with us and Sam, you know, she's very open about the fact that her son um, is now in recovery, but her son went to treatment for marijuana. They didn't realize it was gonna cost $273,000 to get it clean. That, there went his college funds and anything else that the couple had saved for retirement. I don't think people are thinking about that, but when they hear that story, I think it's very powerful. We need to start getting stories about that as well. So uh, how do we deliver them? We stay on the offense, we do a lot with a little, um, and really, you, you all, I mean, depending on your role, obviously, we need to nurture the press, even when they are against you. You know, I often have to hold my nose and make a phone call to writers that I know are biased, that I know used to work for the Marijuana Policy Project, including the news editor of the Huffington Post, who used to run the legalization campaigns 10 years ago. Um, it's very hard to do that sometimes, but it's important we do that to be able to have that relationship with the media and with the press, and of course, um, Chris, is a, Chris Manning is an expert on that. So what are we facing moving forward? Last slide, last one or two slides. This first is this narrative that legalization and marijuana, let's just say generally, is inevitable. Kids are inevitably gonna use it. There's nothing we can do about it. We're never gonna be able to fight this sort of monster that's coming forward. I gotta say, folks, I think legalization is actually, I mean, inevitability is our biggest enemy. I'll say that again. Inevitability is our biggest enemy. I don't think that we should just give in to the idea that every kid is gonna use, or that legalization is just here to stay and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, we're finding out because of Colorado's experience that, you know, let me just tell you, marijuana in practice is a lot uglier than what it looks like in theory. No, in theory it's adults smoking a joint in their house and a regulated market with the drug dealers <laughs> vanishing and um, you know, no real problems and all that. In reality, it's the increased car crashes. It's the school dropouts. It's the candy bars and gummy bears. Do you know what the edibles industry said when that kid ate a marijuana chocolate bar and fell to his death right afterwards because he was having a psychotic episode? Do you know what they said in response? They said he didn't take the recommended serving amount because he was supposed to, we told him at the store that he was supposed to divide the chocolate bar into 16 pieces and eat them one at a time over a three-day period. I don't know about you, but I'm not dividing any chocolate bar into 16 pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea that anybody would be expected to do that is ridiculous. Um, and yet, that's the response. Do you know what the response is when you talk about gummy bears? No, this is, this is you know, the 45-year-old male. We all like gummy bears, but the serving size is one arm. The, you know, one arm of the gummy bear because even one gummy bear can get four people high. 
Um, so I, I don't think most Americans know about this. We need to get this out there. Obviously, there's a money divide in terms of the, the pro side, you know, um, that's a huge, huge issue. Frankly, you know, follow the money in terms of what just happened two weeks ago in this country with legalization in two states, nine in DC, nine million dollars was spent on the pro side. The anti side spent 400,000. Well, no wonder the messages aren't getting out there. Um, so we need to have more innovative ways to do that. And that is why and what we're going to present to you today about one way to get those messages out. So my the take homes I think you should take it are big marijuana is coming. We need to stop them. Things are going badly in these states already. We don't need to fall into the trap of legalization or incarceration. And finally, none of this is uh, inevitable. So I know I spoke very quickly. We have a lot to cover in a little bit of time. These are the websites. I very much appreciate hearing from you. And I look forward to Chris and I presenting on the actual campaign. Thanks so much.